Welcome back to Think Tech. This is Think Tech Tech Talks. I'm Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about what in the world is going on in open AI, but also in AI in general. What changes can we expect on chat, GBT, and AI in general? Um, with uh, Professor Mady Harrit Miracorley. Did I get that right? Yes, I did. Uh, thank you for coming on, Mady. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for having me here. I'll be happy to discuss uh, all the exciting news around AI, open AI, and uh, related use cases. There's so much going on. And, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, you, you resent the fact the media focuses on one issue to the exclusion of others. But I tell you, from my point of view, and maybe from your point of view, too, I'm happy to see that the media focus on open AI and AI. I want to know everything I can know about it because it's it's a tool that can leverage my thought process, my life, my activities, my everything totally. So uh, I don't mind when, when they just stream news at me all day long over AI, and certainly I don't mind talking to you about it. So let's talk about open AI because there's a lot of news about uh, Sam Altman and all that, and it sounds like uh, we really don't know the whole story. But what? What, is, what are the parameters of that story we should know about? I think this has been on the news for a while now. Um, I think the root cause of that news that we observed is that OpenAI was formed as a nonprofit organization. And recently we have seen that the valuation of the company has reached 90 billion. And the news by itself shows a divide in the organization, the nonprofit board and a team that wants to accelerate develop AI solutions faster, get to market and explore. Um, and termination and rehiring of uh, Sam kind of shows that divide that the board had certain concerns. Obviously, there are a lot of speculations that we don't know what happened, but the root of that division is uh, a nonprofit board and uh, tech savvy people that wanted to accelerate and develop AI solutions faster. The outcome shows that OpenAI had a co-founder that was bigger than the board. That's why they hired him back. And a lot of uh, trust within the organizations and the co-founders that they could lead and uh, develop solutions. But I think the message is that what we see in OpenAI, we see in the society as well. There is a divide. There are organizations, individuals that say, maybe we should take our time. Maybe we should be careful. Maybe we should look at humanity aspect of AI solutions once them. And there are the other side of the spectrum that want to build on top of this momentum, accelerate development of AI, build and discover. And I've, I think we've seen that across uh, the society as well, government, public sector as well. And um, there are private sector, let's say we, we look at Google, took a different approach. They're more careful in terms of how they build, how they market, how they come public. Um, but I think that story kind of reflects that um, the nature of open AI as a nonprofit, can it remain nonprofit? Are they going to monetize, which we see they're monetizing at open AI. Uh, but that divide kind of taps into what we face, maybe as a transition phase as a society, uh, humanity versus technology helping us be more productive. Yeah, I, th I totally agree with you. It goes beyond just the technology. When people realize that it has a huge effect on the world, they inevitably uh, they get involved. And and I, I'll offer a thought. I'm interested in your your view of this. Is if AI, open AI started out with a, a certain nonprofit nonprofit aspect to it, which it still is structurally, um, then when they looked around and they saw all the other tech companies. Um, starting products that were profit oriented, they said, "Whoa, we can't, we can't really limit ourselves this way. We'll be eclipsed. Uh, we'll be backwater if we don't watch out. Um, we have to get on board with the profit side of things, also. So that must have created a certain tension. And I'm sure that in the marketplace in general, in the sector called the AI sector, there's a tension. But inevitably." It's like the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. Uh, it, it's so tasty 
And it's so profitable, you can't resist. Do you agree? I, I agree with that. I think that's one of the challenges that potentially OpenAI and Microsoft as one of the major investors in OpenAI has faced that. Uh, seeing all the private sector and even foreign countries, China, tapping into this technology, making profit, building solutions that can be built on top of that. Um, I think that is tempting and that potentially has contributed to some of the conflicts within OpenAI. But I think we should pay an attention to um, AI for good. This is going to change the world and we have to pay attention. I think it's good to have organizations that don't monetize on it, um, at least for a short term, in terms of leveraging these algorithms, uh, small businesses will have troubles. The reason it would have uh, troubles, if you look at, for instance, Bloomberg came out and they developed Bloomberg GPT that specifically trained on financial data. And I'm sure it would do massive uh, predictions and type of analysis that you would need as an uh, expert in that domain. But just training or fine tuning GPT model over three days would cost $3 million. Mm -hmm. How could, who could tap into that type of training, right? These are large organizations that could spend a million dollars per day uh, for three days to fine tune and build a novel product, test it, evaluate it. I think we need to have these nonprofit organizations that still they can generate revenue, $90 billion but they can look at good use cases and AI for good. Uh, I'm hoping that OpenAI remains with it, that realm and uh, doesn't change the original vision of the company. But you mentioned China, and certainly uh, I would say Russia must be involved as a state actor. So you get the nonprofits, you get the profits, the multinational profit corporations, but then you get the state actors. And the state actors have their own agenda. Um, they want to use it for war. Uh, they want to use it for mm, diplomatic relations. They want to use it for control of their of their electorate, their public. Um, and I guess I'm asking, what what is likely to prevail, at least in the foreseeable future, on who will control, who will make most use, who will invest most money? Will it be the nonprofits? Uh, will it be the, the, the multinational profits, maybe the smaller profit companies, or will it be state actors who have big plans? Uh, that's a good question, and I think we are in arms race. If you look at it, everyone is competing, right? China, Russia, United States, Europe, European Union is competing in other ways. They're putting regulations to control the situation. and. If they manage to put the first regulations out there, then there's another significant influence that they have in the development of the AI. I think in terms of state actors, there are a lot of use cases that are new to us. Misinformation, malinformation, China propaganda, we've learned it. We know that is happening. In my previous discussion with you, I covered that partially. But now there are new use cases that you can use uh, learning techniques that are coming out, large language models to implement cyber attacks. Uh, you can use that in manufacturing to innovate and create new technologies. I think that's the landscape that is important for US government to support existing technology companies like OpenAI and the emerging one to accelerate in this area. It's the best interest of the country to have these companies, whether for-profit or non-profit, because we want to be ahead of the game. So I think that that is certainly a factor. But in terms of adversarial use, defense use, ethical use, it's very, very complex. And we need to be able not only to be ahead of that, but also to be able to globally regulate what you could do with these technologies and what is the situation that maybe AI could, in the defense domain, can uh, create a weapon of mass destructions and uh, I think those needs to be potentially regulated. Well, it's interesting. You raise, at least in my mind, the question of exactly how importable and exportable the elements of AI might be. In other words, uh, say I say I have um, I live in in the EU, um, and I have a small AI company. It, it it lives in a basement because it doesn't take a lot of space. 
um, the government may not know exactly where I am or what I'm doing. And I say to myself, this, you know, this um, uh, regulation that the EU is putting on me is a burden. And I could do better if I focused my efforts elsewhere, like in the United States. And the United States, uh, I recall that in the, in the movie Oppenheimer, recently very popular, um, the United States uh, recruited a lot of scientists from Europe, even from Germany, and brought them over here for the Manhattan Project uh, to develop uh, the A-bomb. Um, and so uh, this could happen elsewhere. It could happen in the United States, China, Russia. They could recruit people from other countries um, to work on AI projects, whether it's weapons or maybe positive use, but more likely weapons, um, and bring them into their country, their state, their national state efforts to build AI. Furthermore, the cell of people in the basement in Europe doesn't have to move to Russia. It doesn't have to move to the United States or China. It can do its work in exactly the same location and, and help efforts elsewhere. So it, it, it's completely multinational. It's global. Do you agree that will be more global going forward? I agree with that. And I think uh, that, that adds to the complexity of really putting safeguards and on one side and the other side accelerating the development. Um, on the safeguard, it would be very hard to know which policy would apply. If European unions put certain policies versus United States developed regulations, it would be very difficult which one would apply in terms of jurisdictions. Sometimes a user might be <clears throat> in a different country, the technology might be produced in a different country. Also the ability to know where your users are, so I think it would make that a lot more complex. Um, on the other hand, I think I agree with you that we need to tap into the talents that develop these technologies. If we look at from, from an academic perspective, a lot of scientists, a big percentage of those are foreign nationals. Now, I've written that to national, uh, national science, uh, cyber directorates that we need to provide mechanism to keep the scientists potentially maybe even giving them green card and facilitating their immigrations that we could tap into their capacities, leverage them, and instead of having them leave the country, go to other places that they could build and develop these. And these are people that we trained them within the United States. We use taxpayers' money, we funded them, we made them excellent in what they do in AI research. Now they have to go through that process and there might be opportunities elsewhere. I think we have done that, as you mentioned, with. Uh, um, Defense Act, there was a time that we leveraged foreign nationals in accelerating uh, R&D. Uh, I think that's one area. The other area is um, domestic training. We have a lot of students, undergrads, uh, even maybe earlier stage in high school that I think they need to get into learning how to take the advantage of these technologies, how they could build new products, especially that we are getting to this stage that with these AI solutions, we can do end user programming. You do not need to write code to the extent that we were used to write code. And that opens up the space for even someone that is in high school that has some ideas that they could build technologies. Um, I think it's a competition in terms of talent, in terms of opportunities, and in terms of regulations. Yeah, I recall a, a show we did on Think Tech. This has got to be 10 or 15 years ago about nuclear scientists in the numbered cities in Russia um, that were dedicated to uh, universities uh, that, were, that were doing physics, nuclear physics. And uh, after the Soviet Union fell apart, you had a lot of nuclear scientists uh, sort of on the market. And the U.S. was concerned that they would land in a bad place. So the U.S. had a fund, an NGO fund, but it was government money, um, to, to recruit them, uh, to buy them, so that they wouldn't go to a rogue nation and work on nuclear science there. So it could be the same thing. If the United States really cares about dominating AI, especially you know, weaponized AI, uh, we could follow the same pattern. We could encourage them, come here, work for our companies, work for our government. Uh, in the same way as these fallen Russian nuclear scientists. And I think from a political point of view, from a foreign policy 
from a, a, a global policy point of view, that would be the best thing we could do because otherwise we could have rogue nations take our or take other mm, uh, scientists, other computer scientists and AI developers and, and, and put them to work on the wrong things. You know, um, just in my ordinary daily life and um, uh, in getting the information that social media sends me and uh, that's reported in the newspapers, I have spotted a number of programs um, other than OpenAI. I've seen that OpenAI now you can uh, get on a waiting list to pay $20 a month and have a GPT-4, um, which I, I'm not sure how good it is, but they say it's much better. You can um, sign up for Microsoft Bing. Now, recently, Microsoft Copilot. Um, and I think those uh, have an advantage of uh, access to the whole internet, which is really interesting. Uh, and beyond current open AI GBT, uh, you have Google Bard, and I think Google has another one too. You have Facebook Llama, you have Amazon Bedrock, and Q just came out. Q is a wonderful name. Uh, you have Adobe, especially Photoshop, which expands your photos. You have DID, which does avatars that can talk from text you send it. You have my personal graphical favorite, Mid Journey, through Discord. Um, and uh, you have Leonardo, which is also very, very good. Um, and every time I look, Mady, that list doubles. And, and every company in the world, including companies you never associated with AI, is advertising AI products. Um, what is going on and how do I pick the products I would like to focus on and sign up for? That's a very good question. I think some of these companies that you mentioned, they were AI companies. They just came out very publicly. But if you look at Google, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, Amazon shopping website, it was an AI company. It had recommender system as long as I remember. But now with these large language models, they can do very sophisticated uh, things that was not possible 10 years ago in the recommender system. Uh, I think the list is going to expand. A lot of larger organizations, because of their ability to fine tune and train these uh, large language models on a specific data, are going to be able to deliver unique uh, products in that landscape. Uh, there would be some generic uh, large language models, but if you look at the cost of training them, retraining them, the emergent companies are going to be large, large businesses that have that ability uh, to train. I would not pick up a winner in this race. I think we are going to see a lot of interesting things coming out. And the, the company that comes out first, let's say OpenAI necessarily is not going to be the winner. And in this competition, we have seen that while these major corporations almost did the same thing, but they were quite different. If you look at Google, uh, it had a monopoly. They never claimed that they have a monopoly, but they had a monopoly. The stuff that they provided, uh, they were so unique that Microsoft could not provide that. The same as Microsoft. I think we're going to see that grow, especially with these large corporations. But what also we're going to see is a special use cases. Let's say it's a corporation that is in healthcare. They have access to all healthcare data that they could create a product that no one else has access to because of the data that they have. I think what would differentiate these companies and their suitability in terms of use cases is the underlying data. The data that Google has, Microsoft doesn't have. The data that Amazon has, Google and Microsoft don't have. And the data that Bloomberg has, none of those corporations have. I think that's where massive fine tuning would result in a very smart AI solutions. Um, I think data here is going to be the most valuable uh, piece of the, uh, the, uh, the dilemma. And if you look at even in innovation, if you look at, let's say, NVIDIA is making chips, they have a lot of creative solutions, manufacturing practices internally. If they threw AI at it, they're going to build a solution that could creatively design new products. And that's their own internal IP that has been used to train AI ML system. For picking up a tool, I would go back and see who is building it. What is the underlying data that they have access that all the competitors don't have? 
access to and that would put me in the direction of choosing the right tool right company for my use case yeah well you know to me i would choose and I, the, the jury's out but i would choose um a, uh, a chat gpt uh, program that will incorporate everything on the internet uh, i want i want right up till right now immediately uh, uh so that it's completely current and complete and that would be really really powerful and that and that leads me to you know just from your comment a minute ago though maybe so if one of them has more data and the other one has less data and different data do you see in the future a consolidation this is scary a consolidation of these companies. Now, for example, um, uh, ChatGPT has a certain amount of data, but it's not as much as uh, Microsoft or Google or uh, Amazon. Uh, do you see them, you know, buying and selling and merging in order in order to merge their databases and their large language models so that one is the category killer? Uh, I know there are antitrust issues around that, brand new legal issues over that. Um, but it seems to me that if you wanted to be a category killer, you have to find more data. And that means you have to find it in companies that have data that you don't have. And that means you have to consolidate and merge. Do you think that's going to happen in our AI marketplace? I think we're going to see that in AI marketplace. We also going to see that it would expand into other application domain, finance, and et cetera. I think for that anti antitrust, um, issue that you mentioned, I think we have to pay more attention to acquisitions. Uh, it's not about the software and interfaces and APIs that we see, it's about the data behind that could enable uh, massive new use cases, monopolies that we didn't know before. Uh, and that would be a risk that I think um, we have to pay attention and kind of manage that risk uh, federal commissions needs to get involved and kind of see what are the type of risks that we would be exposed to. I think those are some of the concerns that um, we see in the society, what's going to happen with uh, the acceleration of AI, but all the data that has been collected through the internet, but also use cases that now we are using that data, there are some concerns, privacy, security concerns uh, that we need to tap into. Mm. Yeah, so um, I'm I'm just wondering about the interface too. In other words, I can go on to the uh, pretty much vanilla interface of OpenAI GBT and type my prompt in. Okay, you know, and it doesn't take a lot of skill to do that. But I notice that some of the other companies that are adopting uh, AI interfaces make it much more user friendly. Uh, they make a menu, um, you know, uh, a whole bunch of choices you can make, make it easy, easier for you. Um, where do you think the interface, the sophistication or the user-friendly interface design is going to go? Will it will it stay sort of um, uh, open AI type simple uh, with you know just a prompt box, or will it will it um, give you a series of choices on a menu? Um, I think even now we see that OpenAI, ChatGPT, you have access to APIs, application programming interfaces. Companies that build pretty interfaces actually tap to those APIs that make method calls and they pay OpenAI for any call that they make. And if they exceed certain, there's a price model that they have to follow. So that already been monetized. And I think off the shelf AI algorithms is gonna be the market that there will be major performers because of the cost of retraining and training that would provide those APIs. Smaller companies would pay to have access to those APIs. There would be some middle scale companies that fine tune these large models internally. They can spend $3 million, $4 million to fine tune and they would expose their own APIs for specific tax tasks. And you would see a lot of use cases, app developers, web developers, and emerging use cases that would purchase these APIs and for a price per call or whatever model that they agree to, that they would build those beautiful interfaces, easy to use interfaces, integrated into your phone. Maybe you don't even see that the 
a large language models are in your phone with your daily interactions, you get feedback. But that, to some extent, is uh, accelerating right now at all the scales, uh, large corporations, small corporations, and individuals that are building apps. Yeah, you know, it reminds me of um, of Steve Jobs and, and the iPhone uh, and designing apps that anyone could use that would solve any problem with the apps and opening the market so that anybody could design an app. And you know, that, that has redefined apps on your phone, for sure over the past, what, 10 years. So it sounds from what you say that you have this, this group of the heavy lifters who have the data, the large language models, and, the, and they would sell access to that to smaller companies, even really small companies, which, which have an interface that's friendly and can buy access to the, uh, the large language model from the big, the big AI company. It sounds like that's where it's going. And if that's where it's going, we're going to have a proliferation of these small apps companies with the menu that have access to this extraordinary amount of data. Is that right? That is correct. And I think AI is going to be the next software anywhere in the world that today you see a software. I think we're going to see an AI software sitting behind. If it's your car, your phone, your browser, search engine, Shopping, car, shopping software, trading software, whatever you look at your computer, AI is going to sit there. I think that's going to be the next type of software that we will be working with. You know, you know it, it strikes me, and I think this is probably already happening, that certain marginal products are saying, hey, we are AI. We're really hot stuff when it's not true. I mean, they're not AI and they're not paying the cost of access. Um, because the advertising now, you look at every single software product. I mean, I don't think there's any exceptions. They all say, oh, yeah, we're AI. Watch us go. Am, am I right? Are you, seeing, are you seeing false advertising on this? Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, everyone wants to catch up with the acceleration of AI solutions. So they, they claim, and um, I think we need to be careful because we also don't know very well the consequences of it harms i know that recently there are a lot of organizations software engineering institute that cmu has created ai incident response team that we are gonna see things that don't work or their ethical issues biases accidents with cars and technologies bad financial decisions that those incidents needs to be captured reported tracked and traced into actual model that caused the incident uh, it's exciting time. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the other things that I noticed in, in just looking over the field on the internet uh, is that um, there are jobs. And uh, people, you know, of course, people worry about losing their existing job because AI will replace them. No surprise there. But that happens with any industrial revolution. Uh, however, um, also jobs being created. And there's news about that. And uh, what I get is that if you want to be a prompt engineer, which I guess is designing the algorithms that that take what the user wants, you know, of information about, and making that go to the large language and coming up with an answer, God, that's pretty sexy, actually. What a job that would be, you know. It's like programming on steroids. Um, so you make the algorithm, and for this, they pay you two hundred and fifty thousand small euros every year. This is a lot of bread. Um, yeah. You know, I think a lot of people would be enticed by that because that, that sort of jumps over there, whatever they had in mind for their career, you know? <laughs> I think it's that's true. And if you're creative in terms of coming up with prompts and queries, uh, it's a very interesting job as well. And a lot of results that you would get is dependent on the prompts. So I think that's why certain skills would be required there. But I see that evolving as a new role and job in the market. So how do I make myself ready for that job? I think the more you use these techniques, the more comfortable and the more skillful you become. I think we have to catch up. We have to make sure that we stay relevant with these technologies. That's what about other jobs? What about other jobs? Can you think of other jobs might even pay more? Um, I think the way it impacts 
it still is evolving. I have mentioned last time I had a student that were worried about becoming a software engineer because they thought AI is going to take over their jobs. I think it's going to shuffle the type of jobs that we have. Some may disappear and new jobs may appear. And it's similar to the time that automation came in, software came in. And, you know, if someone working in an office was worried that the software, half of the team is going to lose their job because the software would do that. The software just changed the way we worked. And I think that would be the same with AI. The jobs, some of them may disappear, but new form of job would appear that we need to tap into those. And the goal is to make us more productive. Well, it sounds like a lot of people will get involved, a lot of creative, smart people. And meanwhile, you know, the basic technology is moving forward. There's so many reasons to invest in the large language model, data, you know, the whole internet. That um, that ChatGPT and all of those related search programs, prompt programs, will be more and more powerful. And we talked before the show about you know the kinds of things you could do. The consumer, this is this is all good and getting better. Be really optimistic about how it can help us in our daily lives, and how how it can help government, how it can help scientists themselves. Um, you know, one of the things is uh, you, you want to determine good public policy, just ask it. You want to determine a good strategy for foreign relations, just ask it. Um, you want to you want to you want to find out what you should do with your life today, just ask. What you should have for your next meal, it'll tell you. And it's it's kind of extraordinary that this is um, pervasive and ubiquitous, and that when people realize how much they can ask. A, they're going to use it, and B, the industry is going to provide more and more, um, you know, quality search results. So to answer any question in the world, I mean, our lives will. Gee, it's a little scary, isn't it? Our, our lives, will, and not too far away. I and mean, what are we talking? A year or two, um, where you know, anything you want to know, anything, any guidance you want to know, even personal thoughts, you know, psychology. I mean, you know, I have a problem in my relationships. What do I do? And it'll tell you. And then you'll say, well, no, you didn't get that quite right. And it'll say, well, let me tell you something else. And, and so you can have a conversation with it. I, I can see this affecting life on the planet, every culture, every country, every situation. A am I being too optimistic, maybe? No, I think that's realistic. It's it's going to happen. And I feel we have to tap to the power of AI for uh, public good, uh, better garments, that better decisions can be made. Taxpayers' funds and money is going there. How we could improve better decision-making in government, faster decision-making, that things don't take four, eight years or two presidents' period to be implemented. I think that's one area that we could certainly tap into strategies, costs associated with those strategies. What would happen if I make this decision? What would happen if I don't make this decision? What would happen if I don't make this decision today? Let's say if you look at Maui's fire, what would happen if I don't make this decision today? What would the consequence of that? I think those type of decisions support large language models. Not only they're capturing a collective knowledge that we as a human, humanity, we had it, it was captured on the data on the internet, but also creative connections of this information uh, that one individual cannot keep in their memory, cannot think about all the consequences, but these machines can keep those all together and reason about it. I think it is realistic and we should think of good use cases that improves humanity. How do you prevent, we, we talked about this uh... Uh, you know, in the Paul Chung lecture, how do you put a lid on it? How do you put guardrails? How do you regulate so it's not being used for nefarious purposes, for weapons, for destroying things and people and societies? Um, how how do you put those guardrails on? Can you can you build them into the large language model? Can you can you build them into the interface? Um, can you legislate these things or? Can somebody always get around it? I think with these advancements, there are new attack surfaces and threats that are happening that we need to be careful. Obviously, regulations is good to 
I mean, to put safeguards what corporations can do, because corporations are going to go after maximizing capital and revenue on these technologies. And we've seen a lot of concerns that in terms of data being shared, um, not having accountability, those are characteristics of cor corporations. We're going to see those emerging. But I think it is important for us to understand what we need to preserve in terms of civil rights, human rights, uh, privacy requirements, and so on. So I think the regulations needs to grow. I don't think today we know all the risks and threats and harms. Um, last year, maybe around May time, there was a meeting in White House between all the CV CEOs of major corporations in U.S. talking about the risks and harms. We need to invest in research first to understand those. We need to work with legislators to put safeguards that uh, corporations are not free to all these use all these data in any way that they want. Users' requirements, users' civil rights are protected and privacy is protected. Uh, but I think there is a gap there. That was kind of the source of a divide in OpenAI, in my understanding, a nonprofit board and the technology-centered team. Uh, but I think we have to have more discussions. We have to have a mechanism to capture the harm that is created by AI. Today, we don't know it, but incident response team, they, uh, databases, Homeland Security is planning to create databases around vulnerabilities in AI systems. I think having those databases, creating them, tracking them would give us a better understanding of how to regulate that. Yeah, but your comments make me think of two things. One is Maui. Uh, one of the problems in dealing with the Maui fires is that the government agencies that are assigned to approve permits, as in every island, um, are really slow. And sometimes they're corrupt. Um, and sometimes they make mistakes, silly mistakes, and they do not, and this goes to your point about looking at the implications, they do not mm, follow policies for the development of the larger area, you know, like, like the whole city or the whole island, which they should do. And so I'm thinking if I were a Department of Planning and Permitting official, I would be, should be very concerned that my job is going to go away um, because AI could do everything and rationally and honestly, with due regard for the implications of every decision approving every permit and the permit would be evaluated and, and the result obtained in minutes, not years. Uh, so, you know, that's just one example that comes to mind when you talk about the Maui fire. We really need that. I wonder if anybody's developing that. The other question that comes to mind from this whole discussion, maybe, is preserving you, preserving you. Because if I say that a, a lowly prompt engineer who designs uh, you know, a software for the prompts um, can get paid $250,000, then there must be people out there who have heard your name and would like to have you. Uh, in their companies. Furthermore, there must be people in Washington and elsewhere who would like to have you on their regula regulation boards. Um, you're a hot property, matey. Uh, and anybody in similar circumstances will be even more and more a hot property for industry and for government. Um, so what do you say? What are your career plans? What would happen if somebody calls you immediately after this show and says, matey, we need you. We need you for a million dollars a year. What do you say, matey? Um, so that's a good question. I think for me, it's very simple. I chose to be in um, academia, help kids, educate kids, be in public sector, work for state government, right? So public good of that technology is important. I support different agencies. I do lots of R&D contract, development contract, build solutions that is used in public or private sector, even in academia. But I think uh, helping humanity, helping the public sector, I think that would be a big part of it. Uh, there are a lot of my students and colleagues that are doing a great job in helping the private sector or helping them scale and grow. Uh, but I think AI for good, we have to pay attention we, so we don't get the situations that humanity becomes the slave of uh, artificial intelligence and our life and movements is managed and uh, 
decided by non-humans. Oh, thank you for that. And, and thank you for your service to the community. Really appreciate that. And uh, I think you're at the inflection point where we all are right now in terms of a changing world, uh, a disrupted uh, science, a disrupted computer science uh, where it's going to be different. And it's like riding a wave. <laughs> you, you don't know exactly what characteristics are, but you know you're going somewhere fast. Well, thank you very much, Mady. Really appreciate you coming on. I hope we can do this again soon. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Take care. Aloha. Bye.